welcome to Zed Cloud. So, we use the graphics processing unit in our daily life for various purposes. But how does a graphics card work? In this tutorial series, we will learn 1. The graphics pipeline 2. History of a few old GPUs 3. How a modern GPU works, and why it is so fast 4. Closer look at a real GPU design Let's start with the graphics pipeline the rendering pipeline is mapped onto current graphics acceleration hardware such that the input to the GPU is in the form of vertices. These vertices then undergo transformation and per vertex lighting. At this point in modern GPU pipelines, a custom vertex shader program can be used to manipulate the 3D vertices prior to rasterization. Once transformed and lit, the vertices undergo clipping and rasterization resulting in fragments. A second custom shader program can then be run on each fragment before the final pixel values are output to the frame buffer for display. The graphics pipeline is well suited to the rendering process because it allows the GPU to function as a stream processor since all vertices and fragments can be thought of as independent. This allows all stages of the pipeline to be used simultaneously for different vertices or fragments as they work their way through the pipe. In addition to pipelining vertices and fragments, their independence allows graphics processors to use parallel processing units to process multiple vertices or fragments in a single stage of the pipeline at the same time. A vertex shader is a program executed on the graphics card's GPU which operates on each vertex individually. This facilitates we can write our own custom algorithm to work with the vertexes. Vertex shader takes a single point and can adjust it. Can be used to work out complex. Vertex lighting calculates as a setup for the next stage and or warp the points around, wobble, scale, etc. Primitive assembly is the process of collecting a run of vertex data output from the prior stages and composing it into a sequence of primitives. The type of primitive the user ended with determines how this process works. The output of this process is an ordered sequence of symbol primitives, lines, points, or triangles. If the input is a triangle strip primitive containing 12 vertices, for example, the output of this process will be 10 triangles. If tessellation or geometry shaders are active, then a limited form of primitive assembly is executed before these vertex processing stages. This is used to feed those particular shader stages with individual primitives, rather than a sequence of vertices. The rendering pipeline can also be aborted at this stage. This allows the use of transform feedback operations, without having to actually render something. Primitives that reach this stage are then rasterized in the order in which they were given. The result of rasterizing a primitive is a sequence of fragments. A fragment is a set of state that is used to compute the final data for a pixel, or sample if multi-sampling is enabled, in the output frame buffer. The state for a fragment includes its position in screen space, the sample coverage if multi-sampling is enabled, and a list of arbitrary data that was output from the previous vertex or geometry shader. This last set of data is computed by interpolating between the data values in the vertices for the fragment. The style of interpolation is defined by the shader that outputed those values. The data for each fragment from the rasterization stage is processed by a fragment shader. The output from a fragment shader is a list of colors for each of the color buffers being written to, a depth value, and a stencil value. Fragment shaders are not able to set the stencil data for a fragment, but they do have control over the color and depth values. Fragment shaders are optional. If you render without a fragment shader, the depth and stencil values of the fragment get their usual values. But the value of all of the colors that a fragment could have are undefined. Rendering without a fragment shader is useful when rendering only a primitive's default depth information to the depth buffer such as when performing occlusion query tests. The fragment data output from the fragment processor is then passed through a sequence of steps. The first step is a sequence of culling tests. If a test is active and the fragment fails the test, the underlying pixels, samples are not updated, usually. Many of these tests are only active if the user activates them. The tests are, pixel ownership test, fails if the fragment's pixel is not owned by OpenGL, if another window is overlapping with the GL window always passes when using a frame buffer object. Failure means that the pixel contains undefined values. Scissor test. When enabled, the test fails if the fragment's pixel lies outside of a specified rectangle of the screen. Stencil test. When enabled, the test fails if the stencil value provided by the test does not compare as the user specifies against the stencil value from the underlying sample in the stencil buffer.
Note that the stencil value in the frame buffer can still be modified even if the stencil test fails, and even if the depth test fails. Depth test, when enabled, the test fails if the fragment's depth does not compare as the user specifies against the depth value from the underlying sample in the depth buffer. Though these are specified to happen after the fragment shader, they can be made to happen before the fragment shader under certain conditions. If they happen before the FS, then any culling of the fragment will also prevent the fragment shader from executing, this saving performance. After this, color blending happens. For each fragment color value, there is a specific blending operation between it and the color already in the frame buffer at that location. Logical operations may also take place in lieu of blending, which perform bitwise operations between the fragment colors and frame buffer colors. Lastly, the fragment data is written to the frame buffer. Masking operations allow the user to prevent writes to certain values. Color, depth, and stencil writes can be masked on and off. Individual color channels can be masked as well. On part 2 we will learn about graphics architectures. So, subscribe to stay tuned.